Welcome to the eighth and final lecture, mini lecture, that is, on the brain. Last part we're doing here is the cerebellum. Cerebellum is this semi-wrinkled looking guy just chilling down right here. We see he is just beneath the occipital lobe of the brain, posterior to the brainstem. We can see all of his little, like, mini gyri, and we can see his white matter in there. Remember the white matter from lab? The white matter is called the arbor vitae. Now, the cerebellum is very much involved in complex motor movements. It basically is making sure our muscles are following the instructions that our cerebral cortex is providing them with with. It adjusts muscular actions constantly. It, it knows what we're supposed to be doing and what we're actually doing, and the cerebellum tries to fix it. It also plays a large role in your attention span and language. All right. If we look at another view of the cerebellum, check out the fact that we have three little motor homunculi there. Remember we saw that dude in the primary motor cortex, that little structure that showed the representation of our body with the big hands, and big feet, big eyes, etc. Those are called motor homunculi. And you need all your body parts represented in the cerebellum. If the cerebellum is monitoring your movements and then correcting them so that you can do what you're supposed to be doing whether it's walking, running, pitching a baseball, whatever. Now, also, we can see this little bit in between the two hemispheres of the cerebellum. That little bit, ah, that was a terrible arrow right there, my bad. That little bit is called the vermis. So we got two hemispheres to the cerebellum and the chunk in between, which is the vermis. Okay, cool done with the cerebellum. Now we got the reticular formation, which is a bunch of gray matter structures in your brainstem, in your diencephalon. And it has a sensory component, taking information in, information from your eyeballs, from your, uh, from your ears, from your body. And that sensory part is called the reticular activating system. And the job of all this is to play a big role in your levels of alertness, wakefulness, those things go hand in hand, in transitioning from sleeping to being awake. If you are like starting to doze off on me as I'm giving you this lecture, and all of a sudden something, you know, you hear something and it snaps you back into attention, that is your reticular formation at work. Okay, next up the limbic system called the limbic system because it basically is a set of structures that almost forms a circle within your brain. And we see a lot of those structures here, starting with a gyrus called the cingulate gyrus. Cingulate gyrus is just kind of above your corpus callosum in your cerebral cortex. It is involved in emotions and memory. Those two things, emotions and memory, are going to be a common component of the limbic system. Now, nearby, in the medial temporal lobe, under the cortex, we're going to have a structure called the hippocampus. You can see the hippocampus right here. You can see it right here, a little bit deep there. Hippocampus is very much involved in turning short-term memories into long-term memories, which is what you're doing when you're studying properly. It's also involved in spatial memories, like your ability to know the direction to turn when you're going somewhere and you're driving your car. All right, structure number three is this little almond-shaped guy deep in the temporal lobe deep medial temporal lobe called your amygdala. We talked about earlier, we talked about it earlier, as one of those basal nuclei structures. It is involved in memory, decision making, and very much involved in emotional responses, especially things like fear and anger. All right, near the hippocampus, 
we have something called the parahippocampal gyrus, which for some reason I did not have on this picture. I don't know why I didn't do that. Oh, well, no big deal. The parahippocampal gyrus, like its name implies, is around the hippocampus, and it is important for memory retrieval when you're taking the test, when you've got that long-term memory about this brain stuff, your parahippocampal gyrus will help you get that info back. All right, almost done the limbic system. We've also got the mammillary bodies, which are involved in your sense of smell, but also involved in episodic memory. How you remember things almost sometimes as if they were like, like you're watching a TV show of your memories. Now, remember the fornix from lab? The fornix is this white matter that's going to connect the mammillary bodies to the hippocampus. And all of these guys are collectively your limbic system. Okay, last but not least, we got to talk about the ascending, the sensory pathways to our brain, and the motor, the descending pathways from our brain. So let's do sensory first. Sensory pathways, we're going from receptors in the body to the brain. We're going to have somatosensory pathways that are talking about our skin and our body position, so pain, pressure, temperature, limb angle, that sort of thing, plus viscerosensory pathways. Think about your sense of stomach fullness or bladder fullness. That would be a viscerosensory pathway. Viscero means guts. Now, typically, it is two or three neurons on this path. It is paired, meaning that we got a left path and a right path. And decussation is going to happen because if something happens on the right side of the body, if I slap my right arm, don't know if you can hear that, it's my left cerebral cortex where that info is going. And that crossing of sides is called a decussation. All right, let's look at a pic of this. So we see some receptors down here, sensory neurons, check him out, going through the spinal nerve, dorsal root, dorsal root ganglion, into the dorsal horn, and also going up, 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 up. So that's our first neuron still, going up into the medulla. And in the gray matter in the medulla, we have our synapse between the first and second neuron, and then... Our second neuron switches sides, that's the decussation, up to the thalamus, remember it's our sensory filter, and then to the primary somatosensory cortex. So that, my friends, is the sensory pathway. Let's talk about the motor pathway. Now we're going from the brain to the E vector, i.e. or e.g. the skeletal muscle. At least two neurons in this path, again, paired, left side, right side. And again, a decussation. It's going to happen in the medulla. We're going to switch sides. And that's what's responsible for contralateral control of movement. All right, let's look at this pathway here. We are starting up here in the precentral gyrus. Axons are coming down through the midbrain into the medulla oblongata. We call the bulges there the pyramids. That is where the switching of sides occur. Then down, 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 down through our spinal cord, eventually down into our ventral horn. That is where we synapse right there with our second neuron, which goes out the ventral root to the spinal nerve and out to a skeletal muscle. And that, folks, is the end of the Brain Mini Lectures. All eight of them for your listening pleasure. I will see you next time when we are talking about the cranial nerves. Bye-bye.